And again, we're talking about designing effective assessments. My contact information is on the screen. I'm ha happy to connect with you. Various social media outlets or email NIU. Um, give me a call. I'm happy to connect with you. In terms of in introductions, if you would please post your name, your department or unit, and your university in the text box so that we know who's online together. And it helps us to engage with others in the learning community. So if you click on the bubble at the bottom of the screen, and then just type in your name, department, your university, and what your role is. OK, so we have um, School of Art. We have Foreign Languages. OK, Music teaches music. OK, we have um, Geography. Spanish language program director. OK, awesome. So you can see that we have a variety of different backgrounds, geology. And when we bring together a, a group of people with different backgrounds and, and knowledges, it helps us to enrich the discussions that we have on all topics. So thank you very much for joining us today. OK, we have public administration. OK, the agenda for today is that we'll be talking about the process of creating assessments. And we'll be talking about five principles of assessments. Aligning assessments with course objectives is one of the principles. Integrating the assessments with learning objectives is also important. And we'll talk about each one of these individually. Incorporating both low and high levels of cognition is an aspect that we need to address when we're designing assessments. Making sure that the assessments are fair and reliable. And using the assessments and the information that we gain from the assessments to inform and help us to refine our teaching practices. So those are the main points that we're going to be talking about today. And there are many different types of assessments. We'll talk about several different types of assessments today. I just created a quick word cloud so that you could see different types of assessments. It's not all paper and pencil. Um, there are many different ways to assess students' performance. And in the process of creating assessments, it is important to think about the knowledge and skills that you want students to have when they're finished with the course. What do you want them to know? What do you want them to be able to do? When you think about the knowledge and skills that you want students to have at the end of the course, then that's how you determine the objectives for the course. And after you have determined the objectives, then you have to think about the tasks. So what different tasks are you going to be able to incorporate in class to help the students learn those objectives? And then we need to think about criteria. After the students have completed the tasks, then what criteria are you going to use to determine if their performance was successful? What does good performance look like? That's the criteria. And we'll talk about rubrics. Rubrics are a great way to delineate in a, a very clear manner the expectations that you have for students. They're a great, great way to help you to be consistent in your grading. So that's overall the process of creating assessments. And when you think about your assessments, it's important to align them with the course objectives, as I mentioned a little bit earlier. Integrate the assessments with the learning activities. So assessments don't have to be administered at the very end of the course or at the very end of a, a session or a, a module. You can integrate assessments with your learning activities. 
and utilize both high and low levels of cognition when you're integrating the assessments. So you can see if the students are at the foundational levels of their knowledge or if they're moving toward more advanced, higher levels of cognition. It's important that assessments are reliable and fair, and we'll touch a little bit on reliability and validity. Um, it's just some concepts to keep in mind in terms of assessments. And using the information from assessments to inform your teaching practices. The first principle that I mentioned was aligning assessments with course objectives. So how do we do that? I'm sharing a, a simple graphic that I think very clearly shows a process that you can use to align the objectives and the assessments. First, as I said, you need to think about the course objectives. So specifically, what are those objectives? What do you want the students to know or be able to do at the end of the course or at the end of a certain topic sequence that you're completing? So those are the objectives. The activities are how are you going to help the students learn the objectives, demonstrate their competence and knowledge on these objectives? And then how are you going to know if they learned the knowledge, that they, they met the objective, or that they can complete certain tasks or perform cer certain requirements of a field? Um, for instance, nursing, they have to be able to perform certain clinical activities. Um, so how are you going to know if they're proficient in those? In a business type of environment, how, how are you going to know if they can work together as a team to solve a problem? So this simple process is very helpful in allowing you to design your objectives and your activities and your assessments to make sure that they all connect. So for consideration of your courses, what techniques do you use to align your course objectives and your assessments? When you're designing a course, or you're designing a sequence of classes, how do you make sure that you've aligned the course objectives and the assessments? Take just a second to think about that, and then please type on the screen what process you use. Okay, so somebody said that they use a rubric with the criteria that you distribute to the students. Okay, okay, that's great. So the students see the rubric, they understand the criteria. Another person said that they use a rubric, okay. Another person said that they use a T-chart, so a simple um, draw a T on a piece of paper and then on one column, one side of the T, you have the objectives. And then on the other side of the T, you have the assessments. So you can see that there are different ways to do this. OK, somebody else said that they Bounce ideas off of colleagues, okay, that's a great way to see what other people are doing. Maybe people that teach from a different perspective or have more experience than you do or different kinds of experiences. Okay, um, build course objectives around already established 
assessments. Okay, all right, great. So you can see, so building course objectives around already established assessments, that's maybe a sort of a version of backward design where you have the assessment and then you build the objectives. Okay, all right, great. So we have a lot of people sharing different ideas related to rubrics and working with colleagues or looking at established assessments. That's great. So, and also considering how the objectives and assessments align with the, the syllabus. That's great. So thank you all for sharing your insights and for helping to um, construct knowledge in the community. That's great. Thank you. Another aspect that we need to think about in terms of assessments is that it is important to integrate assessments with the learning activities. So, so don't wait until you know, many, many weeks have been completed before you administer an assessment. There are different types of assessments. There are formative assessments that are conducted ongoing throughout the course, and there are summative assessments, so that's um, after instruction is completed. When you're thinking about formative assessments, those are occurring when instruction is occurring. So um, you might be using surveys, you might be using quick polls to gain an understanding of where students' knowledge is in terms of understanding what you're addressing in class. The formative assessments give the instructor an opportunity to provide feedback and guidance to students and make suggestions so that students have the opportunity to adjust their performance and behavior. Formative assessments are forward-looking and you're trying to help students perform their best. Formative assessments do tend to be low stakes. They are often qualitative. You might have a quiz. You might have a um, plus delta kind of a feedback from students, say, what went right today, what were some issues that were challenging for you today. And then if you collect these from the students, then you can address them in the next class. And for summative assessments, those are more evaluative of performance. They don't impact the current task, tend to be high stakes, and tend to be quantitative. So those would be more um, a larger, higher stakes exam, maybe a final presentation or paper. Those are more summative. So they're not going to provide students the opportunities to change their behavior as formative assessments would do. So that's why you can see it's important to have both formative and summative assessments integrated with your courses. It is also important to ensure that assessments are authentic and that students see real world applications and performance in terms of the assessment. So students will see that this is the assessment that you're using is a, is a way for them to meaningfully apply their knowledge and it feels like it's something that they would do when they get into their career. Authentic assessments are also student-centered. And there's a great book that is authored by Elizabeth Barkley and Claire Howell Major. And the title of it is Learning Assessment Techniques. And it has many different resources related to designing assessments. And it's focused on college faculty. So, so that's a good resource if you're looking for different texts that relate to assessments. I also have throughout this presentation some URLs that I have at the bottom of the screen and throughout some of the slides. And after you receive the link to the recording, you'll be able to look at the URLs and collect more information about the different topics that we're talking about today. So let's talk about examples of assessments. There are many, many different 
types of assessments and how do you decide which assessment makes sense. A few years ago, high impact practices started to receive significant attention in higher education. We were looking for ways to really connect with the students to make sure that we were helping to retain students, to keep them engaged. And the Association of Marriage, um, American Colleges and Universities conducted extensive research related to these high impact practices. And the screen, there are a couple of selected examples. There are more high impact practices than these on the screen. But the examples on the screen are some of those high impact practices that came out of the research from the Association of American Colleges and Universities. And high impact practices are engaging. They help students to learn at deeper levels of understanding, uh, takes them beyond just the foundational understanding and helps them to apply it and synthesize complex concepts. So that's as opposed to being able to maybe cite definitions of, of different key terms, which are important for all disciplines. High impact practices continue to take students to deeper levels of complexity and understanding. And some of those examples are the learning communities. We have learning communities on the NIU campus. There are a variety of living and learning communities. Collaborative assignments and projects help students to learn how to work with each other. And undergraduate research, we have the Research Rookies Program that provides students the opportunity to research with experienced faculty when they're undergraduates. And the diversity and global learning initiatives are also high impact practices. They have a significant impact. They, sh they help students to see different perspectives and, and different cultures. And we also have diversity initiatives um, on campus on a regular basis. And service learning is also a powerful practice that can help students engage with the community in a different way. And many of our disciplines have capstone courses or projects. And these all would fall into different aspects of the high impact practices. And I have the URL at the bottom of the screen where you can click on that um, or you can access the URL after the session is over to get more information about the high impact practices. And we'll look at a couple of those today. Collaborative assignments is one example of a high impact practice. And a couple of key aspects or goals of collaborative learning are related to working and solving problems in the company of others. So they're actually working through problems when they're engaging with their colleagues or other students. <clears throat> Excuse me. And collaborative learning projects also help students to sharpen their own understanding by listening to others. So in this environment, when they're engaged with others and they're trying to solve problems together collectively as a group, they develop and hone different skills. They learn to listen and take notes about key points, write down the questions, and ask them at appropriate times rather than interrupting. And it helps them to sharpen their own understanding while listening to different perspectives. And I've put a, a great resource on here. It is um, out of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And it has information on evaluating collaborative coursework. And we talk about these high impact practices. Faculty often say, yes, those are they're great. I use them in my classes. Some of the challenges that emerge are sometimes it's difficult to assess these high impact practices. And you can see that there's a lot going on here. They're working with other people. They're solving problems. They're considering different perspectives. So I wanted to provide you some different tools that you could use 
if you want to try some of these practices, that you can also have some kind of guidance on how to assess those practices. And also, last fall, the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center at NIU hosted the Teaching Effectiveness Institute. And we hosted Dr. David Mathis from University of Minnesota Twin Cities. And he talked about team-based learning. And that's another kind of a collaborative type of teaching and learning. So I put the URL on the screen so that you can actually go and look at the resources that he shared with us that day. We have them on our faculty development website. You can see the different, uh, you can see his PowerPoint, you can see different tools that he uses throughout the day. And I wanted to make sure that you knew that that was available for your resources as well. Another type of high impact practice that you can use as a, an assessment is service learning or community based learning. So those are types of projects that you're, you're working in the community. So you've learned all of this information in the class and now they take it to the community and they apply it. And they're getting that direct experience with the issues that you're addressing in the curriculum. And it's important because they're applying the information and they're in the real world and they also have the opportunity to reflect on it back in the classroom. So perhaps you would have a um, community-based or service-based learning project where there was a meeting with the various students, you plan the project, and then periodically as the project continues, you come back to the classroom and lead the students through a ver variety of different exercises where they can reflect and deepen their understanding of the application that they've um, completed in the community. You know, what did they learn? What were the challenges? How can they think about this in a different way? What could they have done to maybe, um, maybe next time they would try something a little differently? And the Office of Student Engagement and Experiential Learning at NIU also has opportunities for faculty to work with their department to come up with service-based learning or community-based learning opportunities. And when students are working with the community on these projects, they, they can see that there's value in them giving back. They can see that there's value in participating and engaging with the community. And it prepares them for their life after college when they're working with the community, when they're in their professions, and when they're um, a member of their family or their neighborhood. So those are very powerful high impact practices as well that can be used to assess students learning on a wide variety of concepts that they learned in their classes or in a program. Capstone projects are also an example of high impact practices and those are projects that integrate and apply what students have learned. It goes beyond a, a single assignment that is more complex. Maybe they're performing a musical production or a video production or it's a theater type of a um, delivery to show that they are, that they have mastered the knowledge and skills that were addressed in the courses. Can also use portfolios and I'll show you some information about that today. Portfolios are a great way to create a repository of examples of students work. An art, art exhibit might be another way. Um, designing a project in different disciplines, mock trials, research papers. There are many different ways that students can show their competence and knowledge in capstone courses and capstone projects. Now one thing that I would suggest is that if, if you are using some sort of a capstone final project type of, a, of an assessment, Remember that you can integrate formative assessments throughout that large project. So I would suggest that if you're using a um, 
have a final project for a particular course, then integrate mini assessments throughout that course at key points in time to make sure that the students are um, on track. You can kind of gauge where they are in terms of the different sections of that major project. Can consider these as checkpoints and then you can provide feedback and suggestions that the students can then take and revise their performance. Maybe they need to revise a certain section of this of this project to make sure that it meets those course objectives and the standards established in the rubrics. Some things that you can do also in terms of formative assessments that can be quick are if they're going through one of these major projects and you've talked about a certain aspect of it during a course session. You can have them write a one minute paper near the end of that course session, maybe 10 minutes before the session is over or five minutes before the session is over. And just ask them a couple of questions. What was the most important thing that you learned today? What do you still not understand? And you can see that with just answering two questions, if you collect that information, from the whole class of students, then you can see if there are any patterns. That's a quick way to incorporate a formative assessment into a larger capstone project and help to guide students while they're going through completing this project. Another um, similar project uh, assessment like that is what is the muddiest point? So, five minutes before the end of the class, ask students to write down, okay, what's the most confusing aspect of today's um, session? Or what do you still not understand? What's the most muddy for you? And then again, you can see the patterns and then you can address that in the next class session. There are some different ways to also have students show that they are understanding. One of those is an application article. So, Perhaps you give students 15 minutes near the end of a class and you say, okay, you know, we've talked about these three topics today, write a news article that addresses those major points um, and apply it to a, an authentic world situation. So rather than them, the students saying, okay, the definition of, of these points is X, this is, um, you know, what I learned in class, they're kind of repeating back what you said have them take it to a different level and say, okay, you know, we talked about these three concepts today. We're going to write a news article and show how they apply to a real world situation. It's, it's a little kind of on the novel side, increases interest a little bit, and um, brings in variety, which is good for supporting engagement. And I'll show you some different rubrics today that will help you when sometimes we do have um, challenges identifying how to evaluate some of these projects. So I'll show you a source, a really good source for rubrics today. Portfolios are another interesting way to assess students' performance. And Portfolios are just a very simplistic description of portfolios is it's a collection of, of work and reflections. Reflections are a key aspect of portfolios and a key aspect of learning. So the collection of work and reflections that together describe learning experiences and professional accomplishments. So it's one sentence, but there's a lot packed in there. And at NIU, we rolled out the portfolio tool with Blackboard a, a couple of years ago, and it really has taken off on campus. A number of, of programs are using it, and a um, number of courses are using it. There are different purposes for portfolios. If you want to show students learning, you can ask them to create a learning portfolio. And a learning portfolio is being used by the UNIV 101 courses where, you know, brand new students to NIU are creating portfolios in, the, in their first course. 
and they're putting artifacts, examples of their work in there. And then if they continue this portfolio over a four-year period, you'll be able to see. Um, yes, Dan, did you have a question? Okay, all right, thanks, Dan. Okay, in terms of the learning portfolio, if the student continues to incorporate examples of their performance and examples of their work through four years, you'll be able to see their growth throughout their entire college experience. So that's one example of a portfolio. Something to keep in mind here is why are the students making the portfolio? The reason that they're making the portfolio is going to have an impact on what types of materials they put in the portfolio and who they share the portfolio with. So the learning portfolio is, is a progressive portfolio over time. There's also a type of portfolio where you showcase your best work. So that might be an example of a capstone type of a project where students show their best work. Maybe they've completed their four-year program or they've completed their graduate program. And in this portfolio, they keep examples of their top-notch exemplars of work. So, and maybe they're going to show this as their capstone project for the program. Or maybe they're going to show this when they are in the job market. So you would include different types of work in, in a best work portfolio and an employment portfolio than you would in a learning portfolio. And some programs are using the portfolios for program assessment as well. So it's a, it's a great tool that has lots of different possibilities. And something I want you to know is that there's quite a bit of support that faculty development has created for the portfolio tool. And I've worked very closely with this. So if you have questions about the portfolios, please get a hold of me. I'm happy to help you. The URL at the bottom of the screen is where you can access the documentation and support. And there are templates. Um, there are video tutorials. There are step-by-step -step instructions. So there's quite a bit of of support for you if you would like to use portfolios. <coughs> Excuse me. Case studies are another very effective way that you can assess students' performance. We talked earlier about authentic assessments and case studies have that degree of authenticity because they have real life scenarios and they address a wide range of problems, complex, multifaceted issues, and are used in group discussions. And I was happy to locate um, a National Center of Case Study Teaching and Science repository of case studies. So in, if you access this URL, there are a variety of case studies that have already been created. And you could take a look at those and kind of see what case studies, how they're set up, how they're designed. I know that Harvard has quite a few case studies that uh, people in the School of Business use. And also I put in a resource that explains how you use the case study as part of your teaching. So it gives you some suggestions about, about how to use case studies effectively in your classes. And when students are discussing the case studies, you as a faculty member can be using those formative assessment techniques and reflection prompts to help them, help guide them through the problems. And so that would be if you ask prompts, you can kind of have those mini assessments to determine are they analyzing this at, at a, a deep enough level? Are they catching those nuances? and and unique aspects of the case? Are there questions that you can ask them to kind of help them ferret out those challenges? And that's a quick way to conduct a, a formative assessment while they're actually in that learning process. 
Concept maps are another way that you might consider including um, a different approach to assessments. If you have shared certain principles with students, certain complex topics, you could ask them. There are all kinds of different ways that you could assess that. You could have them draw a concept map and have them write down, okay, what's the theory you're talking about? We're talking about connectivism here, okay? So then the students start to draw this schema that shows, okay, when they think about connectivism, what are the different aspects of that theory? How do the, those aspects connect to the students' lives? And so this pic picture emerges, and then you can see if there are some gaps. Maybe there's a, a missing component that is very important. And if you have students draw these concept maps, you might see trends. Maybe you'll see a lot of people are missing that um, connection. Or maybe it's just a couple of students and you need to kind of um, just help them with certain connections. But concept maps help students who are more visual learners to portray their learning. It kind of makes their learning visible and can be very helpful in, in helping you to assess where they are in that learning continuum. And they add variety of the course, which can be um, helpful in terms of engaging students. Reflective writing is also an, a type of assessment that you can use. And it's, it's a personal response to their experiences in a response to different opinions and their thoughts and feelings. It it's helps them to explore their learning and, and why they have certain perspectives. Helps them to learn how to write and, and think through their learning kind of on a metacognitive level. Helps them see how through the process of writing, writing about their, their learning, how they've actually constructed meaning. It's, it's much more than just summarizing concepts. It's having the students explain how they've come to this understanding. So it goes, be, it goes far beyond a simple explanation of, of a topic. And reflection is an important, important aspect of taking students to that deeper level of learning. It is, it is very important in terms of using portfolios effectively to in, integrate reflective writing as a component of that, of the portfolio. So when a student incorporates a piece of information to demonstrate their learning and experiences in a portfolio, then you can incorporate a reflective writing piece where they write about well, this is what they did in the field, this is what they learned, you know, these are things they would do differently next time. So it kind of closes that loop in terms of the learning, reflection, and um, metacognition. Now, we've talked about a variety of different types of assessments. For a discussion aspect here, what types of assessments are used in your classes? We have people from all different discipline, many different disciplines in, at NIU. So what types of assessments are you using in your classes? We talked about portfolios, we talked about um, case studies. What are you using in your classes? Okay, somebody's using portfolios. Another person is using case studies, okay, clinical practice, portfolios, research study with multiple stages, okay. So the multiple stages can maybe have some of those formative assessments built in with the multiple stages, okay. So collaborative learning, community-based learning, and City of Naperville, okay, so you're using um, some of that partnership with the community, that's great, okay. 
analyzing real world, world data, generating reports, okay. Students, okay, teacher licensure, students have to do a portfolio, okay, digital storage selling projects, okay, great. Okay, so you can see that there are many, many different ways that you can assess students' performance. If you use these, use variety and strategically think about what different types of assessments make sense, you can keep students engaged in the process. That's great. Okay, great. We have a, a great example of a variety of different types of assessments that you're currently using in your classes. Thank you. Another aspect of assessments that is important is to incorporate both low and high level assessments of cognition and one of the ways that you can make sure that you address different levels of cognition is to think about Bloom's taxonomy and the different levels of of that taxonomy so applying, analyzing, evaluating, creating. So when they're creating something that requires a lot more complexity and knowledge than if they're applying it or the foundational levels of, of maybe defining the terms and learning that strong foundation that they need before they can reach those more advanced levels. So if you think about Bloom's taxonomy, and it's a multi-tiered way to express the different levels of knowledge that students have, and you can see that for the higher levels, they need to be able to create something new. For applying, maybe they're applying something in a new way, but for the creating, they're creating something new. And then there are some examples. Um, they can choose to demonstrate, dramatize, employ, illustrate. There's different verbs that you can use to incorporate with your objectives to address these different levels of cognition that are shown in Bloom's taxonomy. And when you look at the taxonomy, it can help you to incorporate both those high levels and more foundational levels of cognition when you're designing a assessments for your course. Now just this is a simple example of different levels of cognition how you might address those in the course. Every discipline has key terms that need to be defined. So that's more foundational information. So they, they need to know the definitions and they need to know how to use the terms. So if they're using the terms, that's a little bit more advanced than defining the terms. And then moving to another level, listing the events that led to 9-11. Okay, so they're saying, uh, you know, on a specific date, this happened and these things happened in sequence and, and that's one level, listing the events, but then explaining the events that's going to require more complexity, more understanding of that multifaceted um, challenging dynamics that occurred. And then theories, we have all disciplines have theories. So you might apply, have them apply the theory of constructivism to their own experience. Or have them apply the theory in something they're doing, in teaching. Have them apply the theory in a project. So it's going to be more complex. They're going to have to take that understanding of the theory and determine how to effectively apply that in a specific situation. So that's going to more, require more complexity. And it'll show you if they've reached those higher levels of cognition. And as your courses continue, you can incorporate the more advanced levels of cognition assessments related to the more advanced levels of cognition and continue to use those mini formative assessments because that'll still give you that knowledge about how they're progressing when they get to those higher levels of cognition. And assessment in large classes, people ask questions about 
um, the unique aspects of large classes, so I wanted to find a resource. So the URL at the bottom is a resource for large classes. Some of the things that you can do is use groups or teams. You can use peer assessments, you know, have them stand up and talk to the people that are close to them in proximity when they're in the class. Or limit the scope of the assessments to shorter papers and presentations so that's manageable, but then you can address those higher levels of cognition on the tests. So you still want to make sure you address the higher level and lower levels of cognition. Just be strategic about, you about how you do that so it's manageable. And this resource is um, very good in terms of providing information when you're dealing with large classes. We also need to make sure that assessments are fair and reliable. And a number of you talked about rubrics when we had some of the discussion and whiteboard activities today. And rubrics are very helpful in terms of helping to, they're great tools for evaluating and rating performance. They can help you to provide consistency and accuracy in your judgment because you have the rubric and the tools that we use at NIU, we have Blackboard and you can build the rubrics into Blackboard. So it can help increase your precision and accuracy and consistency. Rubrics clearly show what is going to be addressed so the students know up front, okay, this is the rubric, these are the standards that I need to meet, and they're informed of the criteria for success. So then they know what they're working for, and you know from the instructor perspective how you're going to grade them. So they're a great tool, and we do have some resources for rubrics as well. The rubric on the screen is, is just one example. There are many, many different examples of, of rubrics. We do have class discussions are common in higher education. So this is an example of one rubric. I'm not saying it's the best. It's just one example. But you can see there's different levels of performance. And then there's a description of each level. So in this one, it says no citations, okay? This one has quoted course content, okay? So they're very specific. And you can take rubrics and you can revise them and help make them to fit the different assignments that and um, cognition that you're evaluating in your course. I talked about the American Association of Colleges and Universities and the rubric project that they they completed a couple of years ago. The rubric that I have on the screen is the integrative learning. It's called value rubric. That's the, the project came up with the acronym value rubrics. And there are 16 rubrics. And they address things like integrative learning, which can be a complex type of assessment. So I find that these rubrics are very helpful They've come up with the different components of integrative learning. And then it includes the different levels of performance. So capstone, milestone, benchmark. In terms of integrative learning, you can see there are connections to experience, connections to the discipline, transferring, integrating communication. So I wanted to show you one of the rubrics so you could see, you could take this and you could adapt it to your needs. And this is the URL for the other, um, it has the complete grouping of 16 rubrics. And you can download them, you just put in your, your email address and it says put it in the cart and you put it in the cart but it's free, you just have to put in your email address. So when it says put it in the cart, don't worry, there's no cost associated with it. And then assessing assessments, and it's important to think about the difficulty, reliability, validity. We all have taken those various courses where we had to think about 
um, statistics and reliability and validity. And in terms of what makes a good assessment, is the difficulty level appropriate? The, the appropriate level of challenge for where the students are at their knowledge level. Is everyone failing the assessment? Or is everyone acing the assessment? If that's the case, then you want to step back and think about, OK, so if everyone's acing this, um, maybe it's time to increase the challenging level. They're, they are mastering this content. That's great. Um, or maybe the assessments are not difficult enough. Or when you design an assessment, include questions or activities that address the different levels of cognition. So you wouldn't want all of the questions to be the ultimate level of challenge. You'd want some that are foundational, some that are mid-level cognition, and some that are the more advanced. And then you can really get an assessment of how is the students, how their knowledge is progressing as a class. And you can use that Bloom's taxonomy to design questions and activities related to those different levels of cognition. And then reliability, we want to measure that it's consistent. So if the students took the test again, would they get about the same score? Um, if they took other assessments that are designed to um, measure the same subject matter, would they get a comparable score? And then in terms of validity, is the assessment measuring what it's supposed to measure? So in terms of content, does it cover the content that it's designed to cover? Um, in terms of criterion, do the indicators support the score? And then for construct, do can it predict other traits? So, you know, there's a lot more in terms of reliability and validity, but it is something to think about when you're designing assessments. And then the last concept that we're going to talk about is assessment should inform your teaching practice. So when you're talking about closing the loop, so teaching the students to use the assessment results to modify their learning practices and behavior. So you had a certain assessment, maybe it was a formative assessment, and they were working on a certain project. So it's, it's not just a grade in your in your grade book, but you've provided feedback, then the students should use that and they can continue to improve their performance. Teach them to, to be empowered to take actions based on the feedback and the assessment results so that they can continue to become more effective independent learners. And the assessment results also help you modify your teaching practices. As I said earlier, if the students are all doing great on certain concepts, then you can probably move on and get, get into more advanced issues related to those concepts. But if a lot of people are struggling, then maybe you need to take a step back and provide the information in a different way or provide more scaffoldings to support their learning. And make sure that you're creating authentic assessments. We talked about that process in the beginning. So now you're closing that loop and you've conducted the assessments, you created them, now you're using them to inform the, the students are using them to inform their learning, you're using them to inform your teaching practices. And for our last discussion, what types of assessments that we discussed today could be used in your classes? So if you could just type a few different samples on the on the screen, what do we talk about today that you might be able to use in your classes in terms of assessments, okay? All right, a couple of different portfolios, okay, concept maps, reflective writing, okay, okay, another concept maps, yep, okay, all right, somebody said one minute paper. Concept map service learning, okay, yes, mm-hmm. Okay, reflective writing. Okay, great. So, so you can see that 
there are lots of different ways to incorporate assessments in your courses. Think about those principles that we talked about, aligning the objectives with the assessments, making sure that they're reliable and fair, that they're authentic. And when you use a variety of different assessments, it helps to keep the students engaged and it helps you to be able to collect the information that you need so that you can continue to um, support the students' needs as they're learning. Okay, well, we're coming to the end of the session today. I would like to thank you very much for attending and for your engagement. It's truly been a pleasure to chat with you today about designing effective assessments. I will be taking the recording and processing it in a couple of days. I will send out the post-workshop evaluation and it will have the link to the recording so that you will, you will have access to that um, after the session. So I'd like to thank you very much for engaging in the workshop and I hope you all have a great semester and keep in contact with me. I am happy to work with you.